So as Walt has already said, and Ken's mentioned this too, the beads or the cell in a box is a porous structure which allows the cells within the bead to survive and even grow. Uh, and nutrients can get in there to keep those cells alive. And whatever the cells are producing can be then secreted out of the bead. But importantly, the pores do not allow cells of the immune system to get into the capsule and to attack these cells. So it's an immunoprotective environment. So whatever the cells can produce is released, and this is usually the therapeutic agent. And by implanting them at the site where you would like the production, you can then target that therapeutic to where you need. Of course, using cells in a bead allows you to have long-term, continuous production of your therapeutic. And you can, if you want, control the release of the products within those beads. Now, this is a technology platform. Walter's already sort of alluded to that. It can be used for many different areas. Some of those areas are listed here, but it's not limited to those areas. You can see it's a wide range of different applications in different diseases. But today, we're going to focus on oncology. And I'd just like to say that encapsulated cells can be used in various approaches to ta attack tumors. You could envisage having encapsulated cells that produce anti-angiogenic factors which cut off the blood supply that a tumor needs to grow. Uh, but we're going to concentrate more on suicide gene prodrug uh, applications. So uh, I think we saw this picture as well in Ken's presentation. Uh, so what we're working with here is a HEC293 cell, as Walter's already mentioned. It's been genetically modified or pre-programmed to overexpress a particular enzyme. That enzyme is cytochrome P450. And then the cells have been encapsulated in cell in a box beads. And what's important about this product is it is a one cell for all patients. So it's an off-the-shelf product that can be used in all patients. So it's not patient-specific, unlike many other cells. So why are we working with a cytochrome P450 enzyme? Well, this enzyme is very important in the conversion of chemotherapeutic agents that are already being used in the clinic for many, many years, like iphosphamide, cyclophosphamide, mafosphamide. And this enzyme converts these non-toxic prodrugs, these chemotherapeutics, into an intermediate form, in this case for iphosphamide, the 4-hydroxy form, and this is a transport form. So this is the one that can get out of cells and back into other cells. So this would be produced in our encapsulated cells, would get out and get into the tumor cell. Very rapidly, this is very short-lived, this form spontaneously decays into two components. One is phosphoramide mustard. This is the component that is generally recognized as being the anti-tumor activity. And it causes a DNA alkylation. It causes that double helix structure to be bonded together. Normally in cells, that has no effect unless a cell tries to divide. And when a cell divides, then it is not able to separate its DNA strands. It's not able to replicate its DNA, and it's shunted into cell death. So this is the principle behind these sort of chemotherapeutic agents. The second component, acrolein, is generally accepted to cause side effects by protein <coughs> modification, so that's not so relevant. Now, cytochrome P450, there's about 50 different members of this enzyme class, and the majority of them are expressed in the liver. So here we have an avatar. This is to show us how, what happens normally in chemotherapy. The chemotherapeutic, the iphosphamide or cyclophosphamide, is given IV. It then finds its way to the liver. In the liver, you have the expression of the cytochrome P450 enzymes. And then the toxic form is shipped out all around the body and attacks dividing cells. So that's the, tu the, the basis for the tumor selectivity. But it also attacks other dividing cells that are harmless or um, unwanted targets, like cells of the hematopoietic stem cell system, so you get a loss of white blood cells, cells lining the gastric tract, so you get sickness, and hair follicles, so you lose your hair. So this is basically what happens with the side effects as well as um, killing the tumor. So just to summarize that in words, 
Ifosamide is actually a prodrug, it's not toxic itself. It needs to be metabolized by cytochrome P450 enzymes. And I mentioned there's quite a few different forms of this enzyme which can activate. So some of the activation forms are even uh, toxic for the patient and don't have an anti-tumor effect. The activated form is highly reactive and it has a very, very short half-life. Within a few minutes, it's already disappeared. That means that organs that are located downstream of the liver will get progressive. The further away they are from the liver, the less and less of the active component they will get. So that means that you've got to use relatively high levels of these uh, chemotherapeutic agents. Pancreatic cat the pancreas is one of the last organs on the circulatory system starting out from the liver. So by the time the metabolites get to the pancreas or the pancreatic tumor, they're in vanishingly small quantities. So our idea many years ago now was to try and create an activation site at the site of the tumor. So to use the cytochrome P450 expressing cells uh, encapsulated, put them next, right up next to the tumor and then get that conversion to happen uh, to the intermediate and then to the toxic form right at the site of the tumor. If this is possible, then you should be able to get very high local concentrations of anti-tumor metabolite and better tumor cell killing. And it should in turn allow you to go in with a lower dose of the chemotherapeutic so you diminish or reduce the side effects of attacking other cells. So said again in words, we, we're creating here an additional iphosphamide activating site at the site of the tumor that should increase the concentration of the active anti-tumor metabolites, so mimicking a high-dose treatment, but without the side effects because we're going in with a relatively low dose. So as I mentioned, we're using cells that genetically express the cytochrome P450 enzyme. The prodrug is given, it gets into the cell, that enzyme activates it and the activated form comes out right up close to the tumor and kills the tumor. Of course, you could in theory use naked cells, but you wouldn't really want to do that because you want a one for all patient treatment, so these cells would be rejected. The other problem with this naked cell approach is, of course, the cells won't stay at the site where you implant them. So this is two reasons why we needed the encapsulation technology. So the capsules house the cells in this shell, this porous shell, and then the drug gets into there. Enzyme-expressing cells then release the activated intermediate, which then finds its way into the tumor cells and kills the tumor. So it's a cell-based therapeutic. It's expressing cytochrome P450. It's an off-the-shelf product, one for all patients. And the encapsulated cells then are put into the blood vessels leading to the tumor and the pancreas here by angiography. They then locally convert a routinely used chemotherapeutic uh, prodrug, which is then activated to its toxic form. And that results in a targeted tumor destruction with low-dose chemo, so less side effects in the whole system. Now, I don't want to steal Matt's thunder. Matt was the PI on this, on both of the studies I'm going to talk about now, but I'm sort of trying to give a bird's eye overview of them. So the first study was a phase one stroke two clinical trial <coughs> done in Rostock with patients with advanced non-resectable pancreatic cancer. That's the majority of patients anyway. A total of 14 patients were treated, and those patients received 300 of these encapsulated cells. So that's about three times 10 to the six cells, so three million cells. They were delivered, as I mentioned, by a catheter, which was uh, inserted into the tumor artery, so inserted into the groin region, spooled up, and released into vessels uh, leading to the tumor. I'll show that in a minute. And then that's the first step. And then the second step is the patient received one-third the dose of, the, of chemotherapy that you know, is standardly used for iphosphamide. And we can just see here on this cartoon, uh, the capsules are placed in these smaller vessels where they can't move anymore. Then, so that's a capsule implantation. Then the ifo is given as an IV at a low dose. The blue arrow here represents the IFO. It goes into the capsule, meets the cells that express those enzymes. The activated form comes out in the form of the red arrows and attacks the tumor.
So this trial showed um, feasibility of the whole approach. It also showed safety. None of these patients uh, suffered from any sort of severe adverse events or adverse events that were related to uh, administration of the capsules or the IFO. Uh, but we saw some evidence of therapeutic effects. There were some tumor reductions. In four of the patients, we showed, saw some tumor reductions, probably underestimated. Uh, 10 showed stable disease. With the imaging technologies that were used when this trial was done, probably it was very difficult to distinguish between dead or fibrotic material and tumor material. I think in the meantime, things have moved along better and we'll get a better uh, understanding of that. But perhaps the most exciting data came from the survival data. The median survival of a control group, and this is a control group from the same clinical center, age, disease, symptom, uh, sex matched as well, uh, shows a median survival of 20 weeks. This was with the best care at that time, which was 5-FU, I believe. Uh, and this fits quite well with what's in the literature. The patients that received encapsulated cells and low-dose ifosfamide showed a doubling of median survival, so from 20 weeks to 40 weeks. And at that time when we were doing this study, GEMSAR just came, had just completed a phase three trial and had a median survival of 28 weeks. Interestingly, the one-year survival was 11% in the control, 18% for GEMSAR, and 36% uh, for the encapsulated cells and low-dose IFO. There was a second trial. Uh, this was a multicentric trial done in four different centers, so Rostock, Berlin, Munich, and Bern in Switzerland. Again, advanced resectable pancreatic cancer patients. A total of 13 patients were treated in this study, and they received between 160 and 400 capsules, and again delivered by the same road. But this time, the amount of chemo that was used was slightly higher. It was two-thirds the standard dose. Otherwise, everything was the same. And you can see from the median survival data, it was about the same. The one-year survival data is slightly poorer. And these patients started to show side effects from the two-thirds dose of the chemotherapeutics. So sort of underscoring that increasing the amount of chemo didn't improve the therapy, but it started to give side effects. So probably one-third of the dose is the way to go. So taken together, these capsules and chemo have been given to 27 patients in total, uh, treated in four different centers. Safety was shown in all of these 27 patients. None of them showed any evidence of inflammatory or immune responses. Eight of the 27 patients showed tumor reductions. Eight of the 27 patients were alive for one year or more. I think one of the patients survived almost, I think, one day short of two years. And the one gram per meter squared ifosfamide, the one-third dose of standard uh, ifosfamide, was better tolerated than the two grams per meter squared. Uh, 